Well, hey everyone, thanks for joining us for The Daily Word. My name is Kyle, I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer, and we're continuing our reading through 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians will be in 1 Corinthians 4. And as we are continuing through, just want to remind you that these chapter breaks were added later by editors just to make it easier to remember where things are. Paul did not intend to say, we're stopping at the end of three and starting at the beginning of four. And so this argument continues through. And when I say argument, I mean just the logical case, the flow of thought. Uh, Paul was a lawyer, and so he liked to uh, make everything make sense as much as possible. And so kind of what we see in this chapter, chapter four, are really two different things. Uh, Number one is what is the ministry of the apostles? Uh, What is Paul doing for the Corinthian church? And then secondly, uh, a reminder that everything that we do and say, everything will be held to account both in this life and in the next. Um, And so as we break this down, we just kind of want to see Paul, Paul begins just by saying, this is how I want you to regard us. We are servants of Christ. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required that stewards be found faithful. So just because somebody claims the office of apostleship, which doesn't exist anymore, by the way, they were eyewitness, first person, uh, commissioned people by Jesus. Uh, None of those people are still alive. Um, But even if they were, they would be required to be faithful to the mysteries of God. That is to what is revealed in scripture. And so anyone, by the way, leaders, uh, any kind of Christian, any kind of leader who is not found faithful to Scripture is not to be regarded as anyone to be listened to. So Paul's saying, even though I'm an apostle, a sent one, I'm not to be listened to, only accept that I'm found faithful. But he says, you know, I, I'm not going to hold myself to your account anyway. I, 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 it's a very small thing that you should, that I should be judged by you or any human court. I don't even judge myself. I, I, I'm judged by the Lord is what he's saying. And so he's, he's letting them know, you know, grief comes in ministry from um, churches, you know, kind of coming after faithful leaders, but that's not going to be what defines me or my ministry or my success or my joy. He's saying, I, I, I don't care, basically, if you judge me. As long as I am faithful to Christ, then God will judge me and he will deal out the rest. He says that in verse five, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes, who will bring the light things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his condemnation from God. He's talking back again to the the uh, Bema judgment uh, of all Christians before Jesus. And he's saying, guys, like we need to be really careful with our words about pronouncing judgment. And, he, and you, you can tell from the letter that the Corinthians sent to him asking questions, he was correcting some of their perspective on this. Uh, In a sense, you know, he's expressing to them what church governance looks like, where it's not a it's not a a, a democracy where everyone gets an equal vote. Uh, It's built the way every other element of divine governance is built, where God is king over the universe. Christ is head of the church. Husbands are head of the household and elders as a plurality are heads over local churches. And the reason for that is because God has established that he's given them the authority Also, he has given the expectation that those are the people who will stand before me in judgment for the decisions made and for the way this runs. And so when we're talking about the local church, he's saying, Paul is saying here, it was the job of the apostles to do this. And then the apostles lay the foundation according to Ephesians 2.20. And the the, the shepherds and teachers and, and elders of churches build on that and continue to exercise faithfulness. So he says, you know, I've... I've applied these things to myself. I'm, I'm staying humble behind the Lord. I'm not working on my own accord, but I am going to be faithful to him and, and, and not worry about what anyone else thinks on that. And he says in verse seven, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. You become rich. Without us, you become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share and rule with you. He's saying like, we would celebrate. You have everything you need in Christ. We did our part. We left. We left you in a good position. And now I'm getting all of these reports that you're falling into sin, that you're disobeying my word, that you're disobeying the command of Christ, that you're in a sense inventing your own version of Christianity and I need to correct you. And he's saying, we're, you know, he wants to remind them, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak. You are strong. You are held in honor. We in disrepute. 
to the present hour we hunger and thirst are poorly dressed buffeted homeless and we labor and work with our hands we when reviled we bless when persecuted we endure when slandered we entreat we've become and are still like the scum of the world the refuse of all things he's like we're not in this for the fame we're not in this for the riches i got nothing you know, if I were in it for that, I would have left already. He's like, I, I've been reviled. He, he talks in other places in the New Testament about being beaten and shipwrecked and left for dead and all of this stuff. And like, I, I get, and he's trying to remind everyone, I get nothing out of this uh, other than, than grief from people I'm trying to do ministry for. And so he, he wants to express, though, that, that there's joy in that. There's joy in Christ. There's joy in the commissioning to this work in seeing everyone else and regarding everyone else as more important than him. And so Paul, as an apostle, used his life for the benefit of other people. And that is the role of a pastor and an apostle. He says, I don't write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became a father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He's saying, look, there's a lot of people that you can look to, but I built that church. I established it. I taught you the gospel. I brought you the good news. Don't work contrary to me, please. He said, I, I was the one who, who labored to bring you into this world in a sense uh, of, of, of Christ. And, and uh, you know, we, we can maintain unity through you continuing in that work of the gospel. He says, I urge you then be imitators of me. And he'll clarify what that means in the next verse, as well as in chapter 11, verse 1, or later on in the letter, he says in verse 17 here, that's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. Specifically, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he says, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Well, then he gets to this final statement here. And he says in verses 18 to 21, some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people but their power for the kingdom of god does not consist of talk but in power what do you wish shall i come to you with the rod or shall i come to you in a spirit of gentleness and so what we see here is occasionally you know just like with a king a president a boss you know a husband or a father over children elders pastors over a church there needs to be uh, expressions of authority or discipline in the realm that they are given authority and discipline, right? So Hebrews 12 says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And discipline is good. It's the key. It's the root idea. It's happening to you, but it's the idea of discipleship. It's the same thing. It's being taught how to live and how to behave. So Paul's saying, look, some of you are in, in this letter are talking like I'm never going to come back. You're making fun. You're, you're ripping my ministry. And, and they're going to find out real quick that I'm coming back. I'm going to talk to you if the Lord wills. And they're going to see the difference between words and authority. They're going to see the difference between mindless talk and, and preference versus the spirit of God on display in my ministry. And he's like, I don't want to come in, in discipline and punishment. That's, that's the rod. Do you want me to bring the rod? Because I will if I have to. But he's like, would you rather I come in a spirit of gentleness? Because if we can correct this and we can get on course and on the same page, I don't need to come and rebuke you. But by all means, I will if I have to. And so 1 Corinthians 4, it's a bit of a tough chapter. It's kind of hard to swallow at times. And it, it's, it's one of those where, you know, God is sort of laying down the law and, and Paul is revealing his heart. But it's good for us to know. And it's good for you to remember to just pray for your pastors. Um, you know, we, we, we go through a lot with you know, helping people and dealing with various sin situations and, and shepherding and all of that. And occasionally uh, sheep are lovely creatures, but sometimes they bite and sometimes they're messy. And that's why the analogy is used in scripture. And so we want to do everything we can not to come with a rod of correction, but with a spirit of gentleness and exhortation and love and building up the body. And Paul is expressing that that is his heart as well. So hopefully that's helpful for 1 Corinthians 4. And I look forward to seeing you next time in 1 Corinthians 5.